Remember, only the disciplined ones are free in life. If you are in discipline, you are a slave to your moods. You are a slave to your passions. If he does this, everyone will know one marathon runner at least. You know, they'll know the guy that broke two hours marathon. And they'll, they'll know him as Elliot, yes. Oh, wow. The scientists in the whole world who are saying the first human being to run under two hours will be in the year 2075. But I approved them wrong. First part there. So that is uh, Eliud Kipchoge, uh, two-time Olympic gold medalist in the marathon, a world record holder, and the first man to run a marathon in under two hours. The words that uh, really struck me at the beginning of that video is when he said, "The only disciplined one, the disciplined ones in life are free. If you aren't disciplined, you are a slave to your moods. You are a slave to your passions." I remember when I was at BBC, uh, friends or ministers would come in and they would share with, uh, with us or with me about how I must really enjoy my time at uh, college because it's going to get way harder afterwards. I, since I've graduated, I think I can say I don't really believe that's true. I have my evenings to myself now. <laughs> I mean, I do have some ministry-related stuff, but I love what I get to do in ministry. Uh, I don't have to write papers in the evening. I don't have projects to, uh, to make during Thanksgiving break. I don't have final exams. <laughs> um, yeah, none of that. The truth is, is that there's a lot more freedom after college. There's also less accountability to make sure you do what you say you will. And there's more responsibility for your actions. The work that you do after BBC won't be turned in to get a grade. <laughs> it's only going to affect the lives of real people and their eternal destinies. Uh, <laughs> after BBC, no one's going to make sure that you read your Bible and study it. No one's going to assign you prayer journals. Um, no one's going to make sure that you're going to church on Sunday and getting involved. You get to choose how to spend your time. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul commissions or instructs Timothy in how he should spend his time, what he should prioritize in his ministry. He tells Timothy, do not waste your time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. That reminded me of a story. So last summer, Serene and I, so if you don't know, Serene's my sister. Yeah, yeah shout out. <laughs> um, and we went on an internship last summer to India. Uh, it was just such a rewarding, eye-opening, I think that'd be a good word to use, experience. Um, one Sunday, they had us go out to a church. I preached, and on the way back, I was sitting next to the, the pastor of this little church, and we got to chatting, just small talk. I thought it would be interesting to ask his opinion on a controversial topic that we discuss a lot in America. Um, so I posed this question to him. Uh, I was just curious to see what his thoughts were. And he went quiet for a long time. I thought he was thinking about it. And then he, he gave an answer that just blew me away. He said, we don't really fight about that much here. We face persecution every day. <laughs> Our people don't have the time to, to argue about those things. I was quiet, Ooh, okay. And then after a little bit of silence, he said again, you know, I think, I think some persecution would help the church in America. He says it would help 
it helped the American church to focus a bit more on what is important. Oof. <laughs> um, some of that is true. I think a lot of that is true. We have so much freedom here. <laughs> Praise God for that. Amen? We have freedom. We can come here as a Bible college. We have all the resources we want in the world to study God's Word, to know it, to research it. All the little details. We have all the time and the resources to do that. How are we going to use this freedom? These resources, how are we going to use them well? Because most of the people in the world don't have that opportunity. Paul tells Timothy, uh, young Timothy in his ministry, what he needs to prioritize, how he should spend his time. He says, don't waste your time on meaningless arguments, on stuff that isn't important. Instead, train yourself or discipline yourself, teach yourself to be godly. We can't afford to obey God when it is convenient to us or pray to our Father when it feels good or when it's, um, when it's a, a good opportunity to do so. We can't just work, worship God on Sunday mornings um, because that's what we've always done. The word train or discipline implies that there is a weakness. Just like Elliot in that video was saying, you have to submit yourself to training. You have to say, I am not able to do this on my own. I need help. I'm going to submit myself to training so that I can reach something far better than I am capable of doing. The trainee chooses to give up pleasure in the moment to achieve a goal that is far better than they can have on their own willpower. Our time is limited, and our goal, as Paul says through the Holy Spirit, is godliness. Nobody casually drifts into godly living. Uh, I don't know why we, I, I often have that in my mind, like it's just gonna happen. We're weak, our natural tendency is to go away from godliness. Our natural uh, desires pull us away from what God wants for us. We must train ourselves to be the people that God asks us to be. Thankfully, God has changed our hearts so that we have a desire to be godly. He's given us these desires um, to become more like Jesus. But we need to discipline ourselves to make us who God made us to be. There's a really good book. I read it here at BBC. It's called The Life You Always Wanted by John Ortberg. Um, and it's about spiritual disciplines. I really, it's a great book, I'd recommend it, but I love the title of that because it's so true. All of those disciplines that we wish we had, like the fruits of the Spirit, having those embedded in your life and just coming out of you, that's the life you always wanted. That's the life we all want. But we need to submit ourselves to training to have the life that we want. In verse 10, Paul explains why Timothy should train himself. He says, this is why we work hard and continue to struggle. For our hope is in the living God, who is the savior of all people, and particularly of all believers. So uh, a couple months ago, I thought I would do a very adult-ish thing. I thought I would uh, change health insurance. Um, <laughs> I logged onto my computer. I just really wanted to look at quotes uh, just to see how much it would cost. Uh, the first thing, obviously, that they want is phone number and email address. So, like a dummy, phone, <laughs> phone number, email address, enter, and I'm sure you can guess what started happening. Immediately, just calls. And these insurance <laughs> salesmen are persistent. I have not talked to people like that before. They would not let me get off the phone. I, would, I wouldn't answer most of the time, but they kept on calling, so I thought, I'll just let them know I'm not really interested. I just wanted a quote. And they just had question after question. Yeah. So who are you with? How much are you paying? Why don't you want a better quote? Um, and they're just like digging in, and eventually I just, like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit too nice, but I had to say, hey, I'm busy, bye. 
Um, <laughs> hang up. These insurance salesmen are trying desperately to make a sale because they, it, they're interested in money. <laughs> they don't care at all about my health or about my well-being. They want to make a sale. I love that our God is not a salesman. He's not trying to make a sale. He's not trying to get something out of us. He doesn't put the important details in the small print <laughs> at the end of the email. He tells Timothy, he tells us, you must work hard. You must struggle, struggle, train to be godly. And he reminds us what we're working for. I, I just love in Matthew chapter 13, uh, Jesus giving illustrations about the kingdom of God. Think of it, Jesus, he knew the kingdom of God. He knew what it was. We don't. We, we just come in here and we're taught about it, but he knew it. And he says, the kingdom of God is like treasure that a man digs up in a field. And that man, as soon as he sees it, runs back home, sells his house, sells his retirement, sells everything he has, just gets rid of it, uh, and goes and buys that field. Cause, and this guy isn't a genius. He just knows, like, that treasure is far more valuable than anything I have. The kingdom of God, we can't put it on a scale with the things in this world. Jesus says when you get it, when you get what I'm talking about, you're not going to think about, ah, oh, is it worth it or not? You're, good. you're just going to sell the house. <laughs> just get rid of it. Because <laughs> it's worth it. It's so worth it. He doesn't play the salesman. He knows what he need, wh what we need. And the Holy Spirit, through Paul, instructs Timothy how he should live and what he should devote himself so that he can have this, this godliness inside of him. We must discipline ourselves to become like Jesus, to have the kingdom of God inside of us. In verse 12, the Holy Spirit uh, tells us, or gives some examples of what godliness looks like, especially in Timothy's life, in his situation. He continues in verse 12, he says, Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young, but be an example to all the believers in what you say and the way you live, in your love, your faith, your purity. Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. That verse, first part of verse 12, I'm sure you've all heard that taken out of context in some manner or form. Um, don't, uh, yeah. Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Basically what Paul's saying is age doesn't determine <laughs> your godliness, that doesn't have any, any part in it. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're younger, but set the example. Be the one leading in these areas of godliness. These examples of godliness in action, Paul tells Timothy that he should stand out, be noticed by the way that he talks, the way that he lives, the way that he loves by his faith and by his purity in all of his actions. Who, doesn't, who here doesn't want to have these things? Who doesn't want to have a life that is so saturated in these ways? These are all very good things that we all want, um, all of us who follow Jesus at least. Our hearts desire these things. We want to be these people with faith that is just burning, that is noticed by people, by a love that is sacrificial. We need to submit ourselves to training so that we can have these areas of um, godliness infiltrate our lives. A problem that arises is that we often, uh, us people, we don't uh, measure godliness in the same way that God does. We use different standards, at least I do. I've done this many times. As people, we tend to gauge godliness by what we can see with our eyes, so people's abilities, their skills, the outward stuff. I know for me, I've often measured a pastor's godliness by his ability to give a, a, a convincing sermon. Um, 
Maybe it's by a person's knowledge of the Bible. They can quote chapter and verse. If they know the Greek and the Hebrew, if they're extra cool, they get a Hebrew tattoo on their forearm. <laughs> no. We tend to measure godliness by how many people you've shared the gospel with or how many people you've baptized or how good a person is at praying, how spiritual they look when they pray. But God measures growth and godliness by the character development that is inside. By the day-to-day -day activities and thoughts in a person's mind that other people don't see. These are the attributes that determine a person's godliness. These are the areas of our life that we need to work at, that we need to train, because other people aren't watching, and they can't do that for us. To teach and train our mouths to be truthful and to be humble. To control our behavior in a way that honors and pleases God. When we decide to love other people sacrificially, just as Jesus did, when we have the courage to do what God says we should because we have faith that he will come through. He is who he says he is. And when we fight against our own impure and selfish motives and desires because we know that God is worth it. The truth is that our future or your future in ministry especially, will not be wholly determined by your skills. How uh, convincing of a speaker you are, or how confident of a leader you are, or about how organized and efficient you are in your work. These are all very, very good skills. We need to work to hone these things. They're gifts from God. We should praise Him for them. In fact, later on in this passage, Paul tells Timothy, use your gifts. God's given you some gifts. Use them. Use them. But what will really make or break your life in ministry and just in general is training or a lack of training in godliness. I mean, we've all heard of that. It's when pastors get caught having affairs or Youth pastors are abusing kids, or church administrators are lying on tax forms. Uh, I guess in the news feed, we're probably hearing about the famous people, but it's, it's always people that are skilled, <laughs> the best speakers, the best leaders, um, and they fail, and they, they don't just fail themselves, they bring a whole bunch of other people down with them. And it's not due to a lack of skills, it's not due to a lack of ability. It's due to a lack of training in godliness. It's due to a lack of submission to do what God says and develop godly character. These are the failings that kill the church. It's a lack of godly character. Now, our motivation in life is something far better than an Olympic gold medal. <laughs> Eliud uh, Kipchoge, he ran in the Olympics this year in Paris. It was his third Olympics, uh, I believe. Um, he was 40 years old. He was unable to, to finish. He had some back problems. Um, but his time as a runner is coming, coming to an end. He's, he's done some amazing things. He sacrificed his body, submitted himself to intense training for a period of time to achieve something that very few people, nobody, has ever done. But his time's up. <laughs> his time as a runner is up. Um, and he will be remembered for until someone else comes along that does better than him, I'm sure. We train and discipline ourselves in godliness to receive an eternal reward with the living God of the universe. Training in godliness is mostly done in secret when other people aren't watching. Like Timothy, we must train ourselves to discipline ourselves so that we can have something far better, something far better in life, something that we all want. How about you? What is an area of godliness and character that you wish to grow in? Do you see some people who uh, exude peace in their lives and you wish that you just had more peace, 
Do you wish that your love for people was tangible so that people could see it? Even if it's not other people seeing it, it's just you and God, this, this real, deep, intimate love. Do you wish that you could regularly exercise self-control to say no to the things that your heart pulls you towards and yes to the things of God? Live in the fullness and joy of knowing God deeper and deeper every day. These are the areas of godly character that will not come by accident. It is by persistent training, by hard work, by even struggling, that we can grow in godliness, become more like Jesus. So our program for training is written out for us. By persisting, persevering, and hard work, we can teach ourselves to become more like Christ every day. And we don't run this race alone. Our Savior Jesus promises he'll be with us always, and his Holy Spirit will fill us and strengthen us to keep going. And someday we will receive our reward. Someday. And we will then be perfected in godliness that will live forever and ever with our Creator. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. There's no point in pretending or acting in front of you. And you're not trying to sell us something. (laughs) Your kingdom is far beyond what we could ever know or deserve. So we thank you, Jesus, for giving us, giving us the kingdom and calling us to be your children. Please teach us and strengthen us that we would persist in training to become godly. We would lay aside our old Uh, selfish, fleshly habits and take up the new life in you to live in godliness that's pleasing to you. And we cannot wait to be in your kingdom where we will not struggle anymore, but we can be free to have the life that we've always wanted, living with you in paradise forever. Amen.